Hello, I am your teacher, Mr. Pachiti, and this is my classroom right here in Las Vegas, Nevada. So put away your mobile phones, put away your creepy monkey with the symbols. It's time to concentrate, it's time to study. This is Smackdown Live, and this is Graded. We kick things off with the WWE Champion Daniel Bryan and he is dressed for action, or should I say undressed for action. Tonight he will face the heart of 205 Live, Mustafa Ali. So before the match, Bryan grabs a mic and says that last week he called you people sheep and he would like to apologize to the sheep because they don't deserve to be compared to you idiots. What a bad man. <laughs> it's early, all right. So he calls us all parasites. He says that the old Daniel Bryan is dead. The Yes Movement is dead. And that this Sunday at TLC, he will crush the former WWE Champion, AJ Styles. I feel like I'm glossing over the promo just a little bit. I'm excited to talk about the match. Daniel Bryan versus Mustafa Ali. So out comes Mustafa and Daniel Bryan introduces him, saying that we might not know who Mustafa Ali is, but Daniel Bryan knows and he thinks he's an amazing performer, an incredible performer, and he's basically bigging him up quite a lot here. But he says that they don't need to have this match tonight because after the match happens, these people, they're gonna forget about it. They won't care because they're fickle, fickle, fickle. Mustafa says that no, he wants a fight, and Daniel Bryan asks what kind of car he drives. Mustafa Ali says, I drive an SUV, which pisses off Daniel Bryan, despite the fact that he needs that slightly larger car. He's got a family, for goodness sake, Daniel. And then he slaps Mustafa Ali in the face a few times. Mustafa Ali slaps him right back. Ring the bloody bell. We've got a match on our hands. So a sensible story told in the match itself, with Daniel Bryan starting off working the legs of Ali, trying to hinder that aerial offense. And then he works the chest. It spills to the outside and then Daniel Bryan just throws Ali into the corner post and Ali sells it beautifully. So a sensible story told in the match itself with Bryan working the legs of Ali, trying to hinder that aerial offense, then he works the chest, then it spills to the outside and Daniel Bryan grabs him and throws Ali into the corner post and Ali sells it beautifully. Ali makes a brief comeback, hitting a stunning Tornado DDT for a really great near fall, but ultimately Daniel Bryan locks in the heel hook and Ali is forced to tap out. So I loved the opening promo, Daniel Bryan continuing to be a pretentious, preachy prick, and I thought the match was good itself. I saw the match announced on social media a few hours before the show, and I got super, super excited because I love Mustafa Ali, it's great to see him on SmackDown, and in my mind I think I was picturing a 20 minute barn burner, which we didn't quite get but the match was still good and it gets a B plus. So what does this mean for Mustafa? Will we see him as a regular part of Smackdown or are they going to Nicky cross him and this will be the only time we see him for the foreseeable future? Who knows personally I'd be quite sad to see him leave 205 Live because as his name suggests he really is the heart of that show. Sure he's not the champion but he feels like one of the most important parts of that show but at the same time he's such a natural convincing baby face that I would quite like to be the one talking about him on a weekly basis here on Smackdown Graded so mixed feelings but as I say a great match. So you know what? Screw Lars Sullivan. Shane Page hire Mustafa Ali to Smackdown Live. I'm really buying into the whole kayfabe here Thing, aren't I? If you've got a big bald gap to fill, just hire Snitsky back. Him and Lars are pretty much the same thing anyway. Oh, and after the match, Daniel Bryan attacks Mustafa Ali again because he drives an SUV. Next up, it's time for the second ever SmackDown Live rap battle, baby. And this actually was better than it had any right to be. The New Day are hosting, for obvious reasons, their words, not mine. The Bar do a parody of Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby, and it was probably the whitest thing that you've ever seen, except except for myself, and it was good. It was cringe, but it was the right kind of cringe. It was still funny, it was self-aware cringe, I guess. The Usos respond with a few pretty funny lines. They rib on Seamus for being in the Ninja Turtles film, despite the fact that he would have been paid a lot, a lot, a lot of money for being in that film. And then they rib on Cesaro for messing his teeth up, impacting his teeth in the corner. Oh. 
Basically, the message was that the Usos are a lot cooler than the bar, but I think we already knew that. The segment ends after the bar try to attack the Usos. The Usos duck, there's a big old kerfuffle and everybody's scrapping. The New Day get laid out, the Usos get laid out and the bar stand tall on the go home episode of Smackdown Live before TLC on Sunday, which means they're definitely losing because that's how wrestling works. This match, it should have still been a TLC match, shouldn't it? Still upset about that. Doesn't matter, the bar looking strong. The segment was... It wasn't awful. Could have been awful. It gets a C plus. It was short. It was sweet. It didn't really hype me for the match on Sunday, that's for sure. But, meh. It's a SmackDown Live rap battle. The second ever. Next up, The Miz is in the ring with Shane's Best in the World World Cup trophy. And he's asking for Shane to come out. No, no, no. He's begging Shane McMahon to come out. He gets on his knees, says, Shane, come out, come out. We need to talk, baby. So Shane's music hits, out comes Shane McMahon, and then The Miz continues the begging, begging Shane to formally announce that they are indeed a tag team, the best tag team in the world. They're Miz, to I guess prove his point, brings out a referee and then some opponents, and their opponents are the Vegas Boys. And I'm pretty sure the Vegas Boys came out to the Festival of Friendship music. So Miz doesn't really do anything in the match at all. The Vegas Boys attacking Shane before the bell rings, and then Shane, beats up both of the Vegas boys. Don't get me wrong, the Vegas boys are pretty pathetic. They're enhancement talent, that's their job. But Shane McMahon absolutely decimates them and then beats them with a triangle lock. Since when has Shane done that? Shane picks up the win for Team Miz and Shane, well, uh, the, the best team in the world. Shane, uh, triangle lock. So I'm gonna give this whole promo match mess a C minus. This is the one story on SmackDown that I'm not really enjoying. I don't really think that Miz and Shane have the best chemistry. I guess Miz is trying to lure Shane in for an eventual match, perhaps even, given the time of year, this could be at WrestleMania. We could be seeing Miz versus Shane at WrestleMania, something I don't think anyone wants to see. It's just a feud that's not, it's not a feud at the moment. It's just a storyline that's not really clicking for me. And that's fine, but I don't know. I, on the go home show, I think there are other things that could have been in this segment's place. Next up, it's time for a Randy Orton promo. Randy Orton will of course square off against Rey Mysterio at TLC in a chairs match because somebody has to have a chairs match. So, why not these two poor bastards? Orton shows some videos on the Tron of his previous attacks on Rey Mysterio and says that all the boys in the back, they're thinking about three letters. Those three letters are TLC, but Rey Mysterio needs to concentrate on a different three letters. And those three letters are the most destructive letters in all of sports entertainment, R, K, Drop the catchphrase, Randy. It's not working. Ray then attacks Randy from behind with a chair because chairs match and then stands tall to close the segment. Not tall, he's Ray Mysterio. Stands to close the segment. Short, sweet, well and truly deserving of a C. I'm not especially hyped for this match at TLC, but with, you know, just a few days to go before the event, I'm not sure anything that they could have done last night on SmackDown would have changed that. It is what it is. It's, it's not a bad feud or anything. It just doesn't, I don't know. Chairs match. Next up, it's time for the team of Jeff Hardy and Rusev versus Samoa Joe and Shinsuke Nakamura combining two feuds into one tag team match player because we've only got two hours here on SmackDown, but we do have time for a dance break, which is what we get before this match. Thanks, Truth. Thanks, Carmella. Not getting old at all. I do feel like time constraints hurt this match a little bit, but the real issue is that neither story was furthered because of this match. And that's a real shame, especially in the case of Jeff Hardy and Samoa Joe. Their feud has become increasingly personal over the past few weeks. And then last night they just had a bit of a wrestle. The match itself was fine. Joe and Jeff did feel like the focal point of the match. They got the majority of the in-ring time together, but Rusev picks up the win, beating Nakamura clean, which I guess does build to their eventual US title match, whenever that title match may be. But yeah, it's just a match, just a match. It's a C grade from me. I expected a little bit more, especially in the case of Joe and Jeff. I think it was a wasted opportunity last night. Main event time, and what a main event is on offer. A WrestleMania rematch, Charlotte Flair versus Asuka, and this was given plenty of time, and it gave us a really nice taste of what to expect on Sunday, a great match overall. Before the match, Becky Lynch comes to ringside, takes a seat next to commentary, making her presence felt, and one really nice thing that I didn't mention earlier, 
Elliot, is that during last night's SmackDown, we saw backstage interviews with all three participants in that first ever women's TLC match on Sunday, and I felt that they did a great job of making that match feel even more important, building the hype effectively for a match which, in my opinion, should be main eventing on Sunday. As for the match, I mean, it wasn't the same quality as their WrestleMania match, but at the same time, it shouldn't be, because why buy the pay-per-view if the TV matches are as good, but for a TV match, it was superb. This was a real competitive match where both women came out looking like viable threats ahead of the match on Sunday. Asuka in the early stages trying to tap Charlotte Flair out early, Charlotte Flair taking back control, working the leg, trying to set up for the figure eight. A few roll-up attempts, some really nice near falls. Charlotte Flair later goes for the spear. It's countered by Asuka beautifully into a lung blower. Asuka with some stiff kicks, and then Charlotte hitting the spear for another great near fall. A nice attempted moonsault by Charlotte, which is then transitioned into an attempted figure eight. Asuka locking in the Asuka lock, and then the match spills to the outside. Charlotte reaches under the ring, grabs a kendo stick, and hits Asuka with it, causing the DQ, and a really nice throwback to her match with Ronda Rousey, and of course, Charlotte's heel turn itself. Charlotte then attacks Becky, who is of course at ringside, but Becky manages to grab the kendo stick, attack Charlotte, and then Asuka grabs the kendo stick, attacks Becky. Asuka standing tall to close this episode of SmackDown, but why are you using a kendo stick? Use a table, use a ladder, use a chair. How are we supposed to know what a table, a ladder, or a chair is when you're using a stick? We're dumb. Overall, a great match, which I'm awarding an A. I loved the finish. It protected both women while making sense from a storyline perspective. And I especially loved Asuka being the one to stand tall to close the show, rebuilding a bit of her credibility after eight months of awful, awful booking. We're not quite there yet, but it did help. So another good SmackDown, not quite as good as previous weeks, but certainly serviceable. I'm giving this one a B. It was only really dragged down by the tag team match, which I didn't think that much of. And I guess the other tag team match, the Miz and Shane stuff, Something about that just isn't working for me. Hopefully it'll progress, it'll move on, and it could be good. It could be good. It's just, there's something about it which I'm not enjoying, and that's fine. Also, I really miss Andrade Cien Almas. Please give him a storyline after TLC. Please. So I'm super excited for TLC on Sunday. Some matches more than others, sure. As I've already mentioned, the match that I'm least excited by, on SmackDown at least, is Rey Mysterio versus Randy Orton. Though I hear that Rey Mysterio is planning on making a spectacular entrance. Is he going to come up through the stage? Who's that jumping out the sky with all the pyro? No. Is he going to be lowered from the rafters like Sting? No. Apparently, he's going to walk through a lucha door. <laughs> Why do people watch this? So that's all from me. Thanks for watching and you can follow me on Twitter here. If you enjoy what we do here at Cultaholic, you can pledge to our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic. And most importantly, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us.